Good morning from London. I'm Anna Edwards alongside Guy Johnson. We're an hour away from the opening trade. Here's what you need to know. Apple reveals its latest AI-powered iPhone. Meanwhile, the tech giant waits for an EU ruling over a possible 13 billion euro tax bill. Chinese equities head for their lowest close in more than uh, five years as bearish sentiment grips the market, but exports from China unexpectedly jumped to a two-year high. Plus, private equity takes centre stage in Paris. We're live from the EPEM conference, where we'll hear from some of the biggest names in the $13 trillion sector. Anna. Equity markets in Europe bounced back yesterday. This morning, they're called largely flat. Uh, we are waiting for the inflation data out of the United States. We're waiting for the debate outcome as well. That's going to be a key story for the markets over the next few hours. So futures are flat. Chinese equities are heading for a five-year low. We'll see whether that happens at the close today. You've got a U.S. two-year yield. Keep an eye on that as we go in to that uh, debate. It's going to be interesting to see what the best metric is to judge the outcome. Could it be Bitcoin? Could it be the two-year? Could it be uh, U.S. equity futures? Euro dollar 110.40. Keep an eye on the dollar for that trade as well. That will be really interesting. Got some U.K. data coming in just a moment as well. All of that on the show. The countdown to the opening trade starts right now. Tuesday the 10th. There are some mornings when nothing happens. This is not one of those mornings. We have an action-packed show for you. We're going to be in Paris in a moment with Critty, but we've got a rocket launch this morning, which we're going to be focusing on. Uh, we've obviously got that presidential debate coming up. Is it the first? Is it the second? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's the first. Certainly the first that is going to have a real impact. Uh, you could argue the first one taking Biden out. This one will have Harris in it. How are we going to judge it? Uh, we've got the court rulings that Anna was mentioning as well. That is going to be really important on both sides of the Atlantic, and we've got labour market data that's going to be dropping onto our screens in just a moment. Huawei is going to be launching a phone as well. This, of course, after Apple launched its latest uh, Apple phone last night, plus lots of other gadgets. The 16 it was meant to be an AI phone. It's an AI phone at some point, Anna. Mm, yes, absolutely. It's glow time, apparently, over at Apple. That was the, uh, that was the name given to this launch. So a new phone. We got new uh, watch uh, information. We got new yep. stuff on uh, all kinds of peripherals. Uh, but the focus really for us was going to be on AI. And crucially, is this going to be enough to convince people to upgrade their phones? So Apple intelligence is the first real answer to artificial yep. intelligence from a business like Apple. And for many people, this will be one of the clues as to, OK, so we've heard about AI a lot. We can have fun going on some of these. Um, uh, these, these sites and asking it to do things for us, but how is it really going to influence our daily lives? This was a first glimpse. To quote uh, Mark Gurman, who I often go to at these times, our colleague over in, uh, in the States, it's going to focus apparently on summarising messages and notifications, and it won't be all kind of gee whiz like its yeah. rivals. And I'm not sure if that's enough. So I read Mark's piece this morning, and, and I felt like I was rereading it because... Every two or three paragraphs, he was just like, it's coming later. Mm, it's coming later. Yes. You're going to have to wait. This is going to be rolled out slowly. So you get the handset, which is capable, but you don't get the software that goes with it. So it's kind of a AI nearly phone. Yes. Um, and there was not a lot of things there. about new colours, certain things coming in new colours. Great, and I, and fantastic. I that was sounding all a bit te ten years ago, you know, the phone will come in this colour. And I, I just, anyway, we'll see. The, the market didn't seem overly moved in no. either direction by any of this. But will it create enough FOMO to get people to upgrade is the key thing. That's the consumer story. But I suppose we can take this bigger picture, can't we, and talk about where this leaves you know, AI and US tech and, and, and link it slightly to what we heard here in Europe yesterday and a lack of tech and a lack of innovation. In so, so I think you can link it to two things, one of which is Draghi and basically saying, you know what, we are in a situation where we have to loosen the red tape in order to drive innovation. We have to do that if we are going to compete. And you think about the fact that Huawei is going to be launching a trifold phone this morning. We'll hopefully bring you some pictures of that a little bit later on this mm. morning. But you've also got these two court cases today on tax... And, Apple's do uh, and, and Google's dominance in, in key markets. And that also is part of Estia's legacy, because she's going to be departing very, very soon. And that just speaks to the Europeans trying to be this regulator. Yeah. And you compare and contrast that with Apple and the innovation it's trying to deliver. I think it's really interesting. Back to the macro this morning. Should we go to the uh, labour market? We can. Getting out in the UK. Let's talk about it. I need to bring up my Wico screen so I'm in the right place at the right time to talk about what we've got here. Looks pretty much in line with expectations. First read, um, the weekly earnings X bonuses come down from 5.4 to 5.1. April is dropping out. So the April number 
was very, very strong because of the living wage going up. So that number drops out. So that brings that data uh, a little bit lower. Uh, the unemployment rate looks like it's uh, static. So it comes down from 4.2 to 4.1 as anticipated. This looks pretty much in line with the expectations. The unemployment data, I think, is maybe taken with a pinch of salt once again. Mm, yeah, the absolutely. Low, the low, low um, response rate. Response rate, exactly. For that, for that piece of data. So we, we certainly do take that with a pinch of salt. Of course, um, um, one of the things that Bloomberg Economics was drawing our attention to was watching private sector pay. So not the yep. overall trends in pay, but the private sector pay. They're saying that that specifically is what the Bank of England is counting on to drop back a little more still. And uh, so we'll be looking for that detail. That doesn't come up um, always initially in the data. So we'll wait to get the details on that. But the big picture here in the UK is all about the budget, really, isn't it? It's on the fiscal yep. side. It's what the government is going to do next. And we have to wait till the end of October but I, to get all of the details. But I think but this data does in some ways feed into that in as much as you... You think about what is happening with the employment story. You think about what is happening with the wages story. You think about what's happening with the inf inflation story. What can the Bank of England do next? How quickly do rates come down? Because that's going to have a really big impact on how much fiscal space potentially Reeves has. Also, the QT programme and what they do with that is going to impact that. So the relationship between the Bank of England and the budget, I think, is really interesting right now. Chinese mark So the mm. data out of China this morning was actually OK. Mm, the the export data yeah. was actually all right. So that, that's a, at least a positive. But you wonder how sustainable that export data is. And, and I think the, it doesn't really change the kind of the gloomy picture surrounding the Chinese economy right now, which is very much reflected in the markets. Absolutely. I mean, the Chinese export data tells you everything about the rest of the world, doesn't it? Not yeah. about China. And the Chinese story specifically is not a good one. I mean, the e equity market response then has not been too negative today, but it's not far from its uh, lowest close, uh, not far from, from its lowest level since uh, January of 2019. The CSI is heading for a fourth year of losses, if you, yep. if you look at what is likely to happen this year. Um, and that really is a big global contrast. Tom was using the same chart at the end of the last hour. Uh, you know, a real global contrast between the US, Europe, India, plenty of other markets you could look at that are telling a, a much brighter story than, than China. And this is all that, you know, the tough work, the work that to some degree many said needed to be done around property and debt levels, that still is overhanging, that still is having a weight, weighty effect on consumers. Is China in a deflationary spiral? If it is, it's hard to get out of, and you're going to need to see a very substantial response. There is no indication yet that the authorities are, are close to delivering that. So you wonder kind of what chilling effect this is going to have on the rest of the global economy. Um, it, it's certainly starting to show up in some of the data, certainly here in Europe. You can see it in the German economy, etc. cetera. Um, Critty's not here because she's in Paris. She's at the International Private Equity Market Conference. Apparently we should call it EPEM. Though international, you would have thought would be IPEM. But anyway, we'll park that thought for the moment. We're being all French. We are, we'll go with the E. It's, mm -hmm. it's underway in Paris, so that's why we're going to go with the E. Investors basically trying to time when the capital markets are going to open up, are unleashing $3 trillion that are wrapped up in private investment right now. The opening trades, Kriti Gupta is there. Kriti, what are you hearing? Well, this is all about whether or not that search for yield is coming to an end. Guy, Anna, it has been two to three years of massive outperformance when it comes to the private capital markets. If you are looking at a stock market that's overvalued, a bond market that's at the whim of the Federal Reserve and central banks around the world, where do you allocate? And private capital has been the answer for a lot of in individual and institutional investors for a very long time. The problem here is that it's been so juicy and so outperforming, but they're not able to return that capital to a lot of their investors. Investors. They're not able to access the capital markets because of so much of the risk and the volatility when it comes to monetary policy, when it comes to geopolitical risk, not to mention election risk as well. This is where the concern lies. When, if in a kind of declining interest rate environment, which we are expecting to kind of see from around the world, does this open up the deal spigot and does it finally get that loosening that we deserve? The problem to that kind of optimism is that we may actually not see those deals come to fruition. We may actually see more and more people stay on the sidelines. However, Europe may be that golden opportunity, at least that's the take out of Apollo this morning. This idea here simply that there's so much desire for investment and for capital. You heard it from Mario Draghi over in Brussels in just the last 24 hours. You've heard it from the French authorities uh, here as well in Paris. The problem, though, is just at how much investment right now. There seems to be some more of optimism, and this is the one place in the world, the one aspect of the markets where Europe may actually be outperforming the United States. And I got to say, I think that catches a lot of people's attention. Kriti, thank you very much. Uh, Kriti uh, will be with us, of course, all through the morning, bringing us plenty of guests, as she mentions, and lots of subjects uh, then, as she's just gone through, that will be on our radar as a result of this event taking place 
in Paris. Uh, we need to feed that into what we're covering today. Plenty of other strands, as Guy, you were talking about at the top of the programme. We're also waiting for final rulings on Apple and uh, its island case. We're also waiting for a decision around Google and a competition case there. Both of those uh, are European competition uh, or European legal rulings that we're waiting for. We'll get analysis of that later in the programme. Huawei's trifold uh, phone launch coming hot on the heels of the, uh, of the Apple new uh, artificial intelligence product. Then at 3 p.m. UK time, we'll hear from Michael Barr uh, of the Fed, of course, over in the States. 2 a.m. UK time, uh, we'll have the Trump-Harris debate. And, of course, this will be in focus. A lot of, uh, you know, desks on Wall Street busy trying to work out what policies so far disclosed mean for the US economy, what they yep. mean for competition policy and for geopolitics and much beyond. But it, uh, at the end of the day, it'll probably be just a, 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 a getting a sense of how these two compare as the last debate was so consequential for reasons that, yep. you know, we know very well. They've never met. They've never shaken hands. They've never said hello to each other. This is the first meeting of these mm. two, which I think is fascinating uh, in itself. How do you judge it? Apparently, Bitcoin is the way to watch this one. You want to have Bitcoin up in, in one screen and the debate up in the other screen <laughs> to give you a sense of what is happening. That's apparently going to give you the most real-time reaction in terms of the markets, probably where the, the greatest liquidity is. That's going to be interesting. Michael Barr is going to be interesting a little bit later on. We'll talk about what is uh, coming out in terms of U.S. capital rules as well. That's a, a big story as well, so keep an eye on that one. As I say, it is a really big morning. There are lots of things happening. Let's update you on some of the other things that we are watching. The high-risk Polaris Dawn mission by SpaceX is going to feature the first ever spacewalk. That's in around three days' time. Uh, we have got one hour, 26 minutes until launch. Uh, the four-person crew will lift off from... Um, I think it's 39A at the NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, we're going to have live coverage of that event. You're looking at a live picture coming to you from Cape Canaveral. Really excited about this one. We're going to walk you through the entire launch process later on in the program. Mario Draghi's vision for the EU is facing a wall of German opposition, apparently. Finance Minister Christian Lindner uh, has taken aim at the centerpiece of the former ECB's president's plan, uh, more common debt to boost private investment. He says he's, quote, very skeptical about Draghi's approach to debt. And Bloomberg has learned that U.S. regulators are planning sweeping changes to propose banking capital heights. The biggest banks will now face a 9% increase in capital requirements. That's a dramatic retreat from the original plan of a 19% increase, um, which is why you want to listen to Michael Barr a little bit later on, because he potentially is going to be talking about this very subject. Yes, absolutely. I mean, do we have short memories or is it time to forget the post-GFC? I mean, that, that, that's what this goes back to, yep. isn't it? Uh, the attempts to regulate the sector better to stop that kind of thing happening again is what this all goes back to. But, of course, there's been a lot of lobbying from the banking sector to try and get these rules uh, scaled back, and we're seeing that. And we've seen other jurisdictions, notably here in Europe, saying we're not making decisions until we know what the US are doing. And we've got a bit of clarity on that now. We're getting a bit of clarity. Maybe we'll get a little bit of clarity from, from Michael Barr a little bit later on. But this it has a wider macroeconomic effect as well. These banks are basically saying, if you require us to carry more capital, we are going to be lending effectively less into the real economy. This is going to have a real macroeconomic effect for the US economy if you force us to do this. So I wonder what the, the spread is on 19 to 9 in terms of the economic impact. Is this another boost, you could argue, for the US economy or less of a drag? Right, yes. Yeah. So they're trying to make the banking problem politicians' problem. And that's, uh, that, that's the way they're trying to cast it, aren't they? Um, interesting banking news out from across the sector, Guy. We've had all kinds of uh, yep. news lines. I was drawn to the Goldman Sachs uh, commentary from Solomon speaking at a Barclays event about the sector, about yep. banking. And a couple of lines on this. But one of them links in with EPEM I thought was interesting. Yes, he was talking about the trading unit and revenue news there might be uh, lower than had been anticipated. Tough comps with the prior period seems to be the issue there. But the thing that stuck out to me is he's talking about slower activity from buyout firms. Yeah. And, I mean, that must be something that in the corridors of Paris right now, you can hear people talking about whether that is turning around. Absolutely. We've been waiting for this for really quite some time. Uh, the investment banking side has been really tough for quite a while. There was inklings that we are seeing a turnaround. Trading has carried these banks for a really long time. Now, I think it's... You've got to bear in mind your comments about the, the, the FIC trading side. The FIC trading side was very strong, mm. maybe a little bit of a fade off that. But there's, there's been this kind of hope at some point that the investment banking story is going to turn around, and we're still waiting. We are still waiting, and in the meantime, HSBC, new CEO coming in there. We have a yep. story over the last 24 hours talking about considering combining their commercial and investment banking businesses. So a new CEO trying to make his mark, perhaps, 
on that particular business. The, the Australian story, let's just fold that in as well. Yeah. It's just one other piece of news. Australia's going to scrap the 81 bonds that are used as, as kind of high-risk bank capital. They're going to get rid of those because of what happened with Credit Suisse. Wow. So we keep them in Europe. Yep. But they might go in Australia. But Australia's decided it's going to get rid of them because of what happened in Switzerland. Excellent. We'll keep an eye on that story. So lots of different threads around the banking scene this morning. Coming up on the programme then, uh, we'll get back to a number of these stories once again. The EU could make a major ruling impacting the tech sector. We'll discuss with a former EU competition official, so we're waiting to hear about uh, legal challenges to Apple and also to Google+. Plus. Apple's hopes to take a bigger bite out of the market with its latest AI iPhone offering. We will get analysis of what we heard, what was revealed uh, at Glow Time, apparently. Up next, Critty is live in Paris with a special guest from the EPEM Private Equity Conference. If you have any questions for our guests, please get in touch with the team that puts together the programme. IB plus BBTV Go is the function to use this morning. This is Bloomberg. suddenly seeing is a realization that rates are not going back down to zero, cost of capital is what it is, and uh, sponsors are needing to ultimately sell these companies. So what we're seeing right now is a convergence between buyer and seller expectations, and you're seeing a pickup in transactions. We've been incredibly active recently, putting out over $2 billion uh, here in Europe alone. And so we're seeing that expectation, and what you're seeing is some very high quality companies being sold at prices that we think are attractive, and we think that trend will continue. Rob Seminara, head of Europe at Apollo, speaking to Critty in Paris at EPEM in the last hour. Let's go back there right now. Critty, back over to you. Well, Guy, Anna, thank you. One of the big conversations right now, of course, is looking forward. We've seen this massive outperformance that we're seeing, of course, in the private capital markets in the last couple of years, despite a higher interest rate picture. Now we're going in the opposite direction. How does that show up in the private markets, and how does that show up specifically in Europe? We have the perfect guest to talk about that. Robert, Ste uh, excuse me, Frederick Stevenen of, of PAI Partners joins me here. They manage about $31 billion of AUM. Frederick, a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Talk to us about this kind of global easing cycle that is right on the horizon that we're seeing. The Federal Reserve, the ECB, of course, on Thursday as well. It feels like so much of the private capital growth that we've seen in the last couple of years has been the search for yield in the face of very high valuations cross asset. In the face of a global easing cycle, how does that affect private markets? Well, I think you raised the right questions. I mean, clearly, interest rate has supported the performance that some of the funds have delivered. I think if you look at strategy, um, you know, there are various strategy in private markets, but those that are more operationally driven are probably immune from any, uh, you know, I guess, interest rate cycle, as basically you're gaining uh, performance through transforming the business you own rather than through financial engineering. I think at least that's what PEI does, but more fundamentally, I think that is uh, what PEI and sorry, private equity should be all about. It's about the high level of transformation we bring to businesses rather than financial engineering. When it comes to kind of this deal structure, though, it feels like there is this rush to return capital for, for so many investors. And we hear it from the outside. We hear it from hedge funds. We hear it from endowments. Then you speak to folks within the industry, and they're not feeling that pressure. How long? Well, I do think there's a cycle to our business. I mean, we basically, you know, we deploy capital, you know, you send it back, and then you go back to your clients to ask for more capital. If the, the piece in the middle, which is sending back, doesn't happen, there is a, you know, I guess the industry faces a drought period in terms of fundraising, which, which we can yeah. see right now. I think as the cycle starts to accelerate again, and there's many reasons why the M&A markets are reopening, one of which is the lowering of interest rate, I think that cycle will start again. And I think the pump in terms of, you know, sending back capital and then redeployment will, will start. I think hedge fund and endowments have a slightly different, I guess, both performance matrix and more importantly, their rhyme in terms of investments is, is slightly different to ours. But so much of what you're talking about hinges on the capital markets opening up. If you don't actually see that happen, despite these lower interest rates that we're expecting in the back half of this year going into next year, globally, what gets in the way of that? Well, I think what gets in the way is, I mean, like always, it's, it's about investing is about, uh, I guess, confidence in the world. Uh, and, and clearly what we've seen in 2024 
is the financial condition, to your point, the, the debt capital market have probably never been as strong as what they are right now. If you look at the spread versus risk, you know, it's a very, very good time to be borrowing. But at the same time, the lack of confidence, I guess the disconnect between vendors, price expectation and buyers willingness to, to fund these is just not there. Yeah. Is that going to change? Yes, I think the world, I mean, as the easing happens, I think you will see a positive momentum. And I would expect next year to be quite busy on that basis. You use that keyword confidence. And I want to apply that to what we're seeing in Europe. There's a very big lack of confidence right now. And I think a lot of it feels like it's coming from this tension between this need for investment, this need for capital, deepening capital markets, bringing it to the efficiency that you see in other parts of the world. And yet there's no money to do that from a fiscal perspective. Does that clear the way for private capital or does that make it easier to operate? Um, it, I mean, the answer to your second question, and, you know, the regulation in Europe is probably more stringent than in many other places of the world. It's not going to make it easier. What's very clear is probably more need for private capital to fund uh, what is, I mean, you, we saw the draggy paper come out yesterday, but, but clearly if you look at the aging in the old economy, I'm not talking about the digital economy, I'm talking about the old economy of our facilities, it's too old. We need to invest, we need to modernize, we need to transform. Uh, that will require private capital. I think the government you know, are recognizing this. So there's probably across Europe you can see more willingness to engage with private capital provider. Whether it's enough for this acceleration to happen, I'm not sure. I do believe that there's no, in the fiscal world in which we are, there's not enough money in public hands to do that. So they will need to turn to something different. So a conversation we had with Apollo just, just a short while ago made the argument that a way to encourage that private investment and to eliminate some of that risk is for governments to have the backstop. You talk about the regulatory scrutiny. Is there a way they can incentivize that when it comes to almost assuring or backstopping some of these investments? I, I think that's more an insurance model than, yeah. a, than a private capital model. So I, is there a way to backstop? Yes. I don't think that's the right uh, thinking behind it. I think the, the reality is if the economical model is valid, then I think people will deploy capital because there's return in these investments, but you don't need to backstop. I think the problem is more that Europe needs to stabilize its regulatory environment. So when you make an investment, you make it with a 10, 15, 20 year yeah. outlook that is positive. The, the constant change, the increasing pressure makes it difficult. And I think, you know, what we have, you know, because of our, I guess, uh, all the rules that come out of Brussels, we need to make sure there's a continuum in those and that there's not this constant threat to new regulation on, on top of new regulation. Coming from France, I'm French, we're probably the most regulated part of <laughs> Europe. So I know the feeling and, yeah. and I agree this is quite difficult if you look at long term deployment of capital. So what, what's getting in the way here from a regulatory standpoint, we're talking about the carried interest regime in, in the UK as well. What would you change? If you had a magic wand, what would you change? I think you need to lighten the regulation and make it stable. Which piece? Well, you know, I don't think about, I mean, carried taxation is one thing, but, but you know, so, and I'm not talking about carried, I'm talking generally taxation in our industry, stability is good. And that's why Luxembourg has, has had such a success, because it's a very stable regime, or Ireland, if you want. Uh, I think the rest of Europe needs to kind of agree what they want to do and have stability over a long period, which then allows you to think about long-term investments. If you have a two-year window, it's just never going to work. All right, Frederick Stevenson, we will leave it there. Thank um, you very much. A partner over at PAI Partners, we thank you so much. Look, he's making that crucial point, Guy and Anna, which is, again, you have this tension, you want this investment in Europe, and yet the regulation gets in the way. It's a really fascinating conversation right off the heels of what Mario Draghi is talking about and right ahead of some major decisions coming out of the EU Commission. Yeah, absolutely, Chrissy. Uh, thank you for that conversation. And we will be uh, picking up on that regulatory push against big tech in Europe and the legal challenges, rather, against big tech. It's two of those coming today, two of those legal verdicts coming today, and we'll get more details on that. That's not the only tech angling today's programme. Of course, we'll be uh, unpacking what we heard from Apple yesterday, revealing the latest version of its flagship uh, iPhone, aiming to entice buyers with the promise of AI-powered tools. We will also look ahead to the SpaceX launch. That's just over an hour away. Um, and uh, we will be here, and live pictures, of course, coming to you from Florida, from Cape Canaveral. The team waiting, uh, putting the final touches to that uh, mission planning, and we will get to that shortly. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everybody. 30 minutes from the start of, uh, well, the opening trade here in Europe. And uh, the futures picture for Europe looks fairly, well, mixed. If you look at FTSE futures, they are actually down a little. But the, which is interesting because commodity prices are not. 
And so I wonder if that uh, is exactly how things come to pass. Euro stocks 50 futures I see are entirely flat. Uh, so we're kind of mixed on the European futures picture. Things seem to be in flux through the Asia session. Let's have a look at where we are there on China. The CSI 300 coming off its earlier losses. We had some export data that was, uh, was telling a more positive picture for the Chinese economy, even if it's about the rest of the world rather than about China. And that seems to be um, weighing into or at least being factored into the thinking. We see the CSI coming back just a touch, although I can see it's now flattened off once again. Uh, the power is pretty, pretty unmoved by some of the data we got out this morning, Guy. I wonder what markets are waiting for. Is it the debate? Is it mm. the data, the, the CPI data? We've got the debate today, the CPI yeah. data tomorrow out of the United States. A couple of things you could wait for Potentially. if you were so inclined. Yeah, I both seem like major events um, and, and both could move markets, so we'll see. It does seem at the moment as if the markets have reasonably becalmed after yesterday's uh, equity bounce back. Um, one stock that didn't bounce back, particularly on the back of uh, its latest iPhone was Apple. Uh, so it's launched the 16. Uh, the tech giant is betting that it can entice consumers with a modest hardware upgrade. Actually, some of the upper end phones and the processing is pretty, pretty amazing. But the whole idea of this launch was that we were going to see the AI technology that is going to be ultimately included with this product and start to get an idea of the impact that it's going to have. It, it was very much a here's the phone you're going to have to wait for the AI a little bit later. Matt Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now. Any surprises? Was that an AI phone? It didn't feel like an AI phone. It felt like a, an AI phone that's waiting for some software that will make it an AI phone. Yeah, I, th I, th I think it's fair. I mean, clearly it's an AI-capable phone, but as you say, you know, the critical piece here is the software. The software isn't ready yet, won't come uh, until October for the first release, and there'll be waves and waves beyond that. So I think, really, you're looking at 2025 for yeah. the most significant kind of changes in, in what this device is capable of, and that's perhaps when you'll start to capture the imagination uh, of um, <laughs> consumers. Of yeah, okay. a little bit more, yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim Cook's listening to me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and obviously in the, in the same time, you've got the whole Android ecosystem, which is kind of pushing forward with you know, Google supporting lots of things. So there's a bit of catch-up here for Apple, uh, and they're still in that catch-up process. So, yeah, you know, nothing really surprising yesterday. Obviously, a lot of the emphasis about the actual demonstration was some of the hardware features just like the kind yep. of cam camera control, which is quite neat too. Uh, but yeah, on AI still, you know, watch the mm. space. And so with that all said then, is, it, is, is an AI-ready phone enough to drive another smartphone super cycle? Because that's what the, the company will be hoping for. And for all those waiting to see just what AI will deliver to, to you know, average consumers and to society, people are mm. waiting for some kind of killer AI app. And obviously that wasn't there yesterday. Maybe that's not what we should have looked for. But... No, yeah. And I, I think yeah, my view would be that, no, you're not going to see a massive super cycle in the near term on the back of this. I mean, you know, this, this, the December quarter coming up um, is always a massive quarter for Apple in terms of iPhone sales, maybe 50% more revenue from iPhone than any other quarter. Uh, but I think in terms of the, the prospect of a super cycle, it really is into next year. And perhaps even we have to wait for the iPhone 17, uh, which might be a more significant kind of form uh, factor change yeah. as well before you kind of um, get some big excitement. They, they all look the same, though, don't they? I, that, for, I, I don't know what version of, of uh, Apple phone you've got, but it, but it probably doesn't look that dissimilar. There's a new button, yeah. there's basically... I'm Try. sure there are people much younger than me who can tell the difference. I'm sure at, they can. My children, my children could definitely, <laughs> definitely perform that task. Trifold phones? We're waiting for the mm. Huawei. Yeah, that's um, coming up. Why? Much right uh, we're about to get it. I yeah. think apparently we're, we're waiting for the feed to come up that'll show us some pictures of this. I, are we are we struggling with the form factor? Is there anything that's significantly changed with the form factor here? I, does the, does the Apple product? kind of story take a big leap forward, leap forward when we get a new phone. I look at this, I'm, I'm struggling with why you would want to try a yeah. phone, but anyway, we'll pop that thought as well. But, but was there anything kind of, from a visual point of view, from a characteristics of how you interact with it point of view, mm. is there anything here that kind of changes the narrative? Or is, it, or is this all going to be about software? Because Huawei is taking a different route. Yeah, they are. And, and, you know, we've seen some of the other Android uh, companies do yeah. the same thing too, Samsung, you know, with, uh, with Volt phones. You know, I think it's, that's quite a niche product. Um, obviously, Apple's kind of held back for a long time. Whether we'll ever see an Apple equivalent, who knows? I mean, I think, you know, we've all, we've all got very used to what this kind of smartphone feels like yeah. in your hands. So I think it's going to be t quite something to kind of shift the consumer... Um, affection yeah. for this device. You know, you've got things like the new Rabbit thing, which is you know, kind of like a more square device, which is more visual. So people are... They're, they're experimenting. Are, yeah, experimenting with things. But I think it's going to take 
quite a big leap to kind of really change this kind of smartphone form factor. I, I, had, a fo I had a folding phone, but mm, that was quite some day. time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Star yeah. Tech. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We all remember those. I, I think the technology might have moved on a little. I hope it has. Um, so we've done mm. a couple of launches. Apple yeah. launch. You were talking about Huawei's launch. Yeah. We have another launch of an yes. entirely different nature mm -hmm. to focus on this morning, uh, Matt. A, a SpaceX launch. Yes. And, you know, there are many of these, but this one is significant because is. of what the astronauts are going to be doing in three days' time when they get up there into space. Yeah, now, how far they're going. That's right, yeah, Polaris Dawn. So it's like a, a, a kind of private enterprise space mission, for like, as you say, like four astronauts going up, and they're going to be completely um, depressurizing uh, the Crew Dragon capsule and going on some um, kind of uh, spacewalks, essentially. Mm. And so there's lots of things about this um, which are significant for the kind of bigger picture of space. Uh, obviously, the, the kind of spacewalks themselves are significant. It's the kind of going to be the highest. Um, orbit um, for ever um, and they're testing lots of things and they're testing this extra vehicle uh, EVA suit uh, essentially a space suit uh, which can be significant for all sorts of things like building bases on the moon and Mars so it's yes. kind of like real mid to long term. So if and we're all going to go there we're going to need cheaper suits um, and that's what this yeah, is a lot of them. about. Yes. Yeah, yeah fancier suits yeah uh, and also you know that the lots of kind of um, scientific tests which are significant for those kind of longer space trips too so you know, understanding uh, the effects of space travel on the human biology mm. so there's lots of significance here um, ab yep. about the mid to long term space the spacesuits look very cool, I have to say. <laughs> I think they look awesome. The helmets look particularly awesome. They look pretty the awesome on Earth. I mean... They, they look, just... look amazing in space. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> Matt, thanks very much indeed. We'll be back, Matt, a little bit later when you bring you that rocket launch. Anna mentioned another launch, the Huawei phone launch. Trifold phone? Do you need one of those? Want one of those? Anyway, Huawei is launching one. This is... You're, you're looking at live pictures. This is the launch event, which <laughs> looks phones. dramatic, <laughs> to say the least. It's like an Olympics opening ceremony. It... it does um, anyway? I, I'm, I'm, yeah. Like Tim could pay attention. Um, <laughs> anyway, this is going to ultimately reveal at some point um, a new trifold phone. It, it obviously has been timed significantly for this uh, Apple launch. You could argue as well. Anything you can do. I can do better. Anyway, uh, we've got lots of launches to focus on this morning. Uh, we will be bringing you the rocket launch. We will be bringing you the Huawei launch. We've obviously got EPEM taking place in Paris as well. Kri Gupta is going to be back in a minute. Alicia Wood, uh, a partner at KKR. Alicia Wood, I may need to pronounce that correctly, uh, is going to be joining us shortly. Very much looking forward to this conversation. This is Bloomberg. This is the opening trade. I'm Kriti Gupta, live in Paris at the EPEM conference. We are talking about private markets, and we're doing it as we're staring down the barrel of a global easing cycle on the horizon. Dovishness coming out of the ECB, potentially 50 basis points. I say potential, big grain of salt there out of the Federal Reserve uh, shortly, uh, after, shortly after the ECB, I should say. How does it all show up in private markets, especially when we're talking about $3 trillion wrapped up in the markets that people are waiting to be t deployed in the public ones? I've got the perfect guess for it. Elisa Wood, a partner over at KKR, joins me right here in Paris this morning. Elisa, a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you so much uh, for making the time. I've got to kick it off with the question that everyone's asking. When do not private investors get their money back? Listen, I think the markets are functioning today. And if you see what's happening across the market, you're seeing act activity levels that you haven't seen, honestly, since the early part of 22. IPOs are up 40 percent. M&A is up 30 percent year over year. You know, right now, I think we have five LBO loans pricing in the market today. And in addition to that, there are probably another 30 that are looking to price. That activity level shows that the markets are functioning and that capital is flowing, which is honestly what we all need for money to come back. We do, except there's a criticism here that the capital markets haven't fully opened up yet. And you're seeing that in some of the pricing as well. And I'm curious how much of the interest rate story helps that along. Absolutely. I mean, listen, the interest rates, an interest rate cut helps everybody, right? So sure. let's let's not, uh, you know, forget that piece of it. But I think at the end of the day, what we've seen is the capital markets are discerning. This is not a market where the rising tide is left, lifting all boats, right? They are very, very specific to managers. They're very specific to companies. And what we're seeing is investors are looking at the difference. And that's actually a good thing for, for many firms and managers like ourselves really trying 
trying to parse through what's where's the signal and where's the noise. Well, speaking of, it feels like a lot of the signal might be coming from the pace of rate changes. And I say this in the context of so much of the outperformance in private markets feels like it's a function of this massive interest rate cycle, a historic one when you're mm -hmm. talking, about, talking about the pace of it. Does it work the same way on the downside? If you see a historic pace of easing as well mm -hmm. to manage the soft landing, how does it show up in the private markets? Does it help or hurt valuations? Sure. I think it's a toggle, and you got to think about it that way. When we saw rates go up, what happens? you got to balance it out with prices and valuations coming down. Yeah. Um, so I think there will be. Now, it'll take a little bit of time for it to happen the other way, but I do think that toggle is going to happen. Now, I think it's really important that if you're an investor and, and like us and you're buying companies, what are you relying on to deliver your returns? If you're relying on cheap debt, you've got a problem. If you're relying on focusing on growth of your bottom line, M&A activity, um, really top leveling management, well, guess what? This is an environment where you can find some very interesting places to put capital to work. Yeah. And this will turn into very good vintage years looking at our 50 year history. That's what we've seen. Well, it's, it's fascinating that you talk about this in a 50 year history because right now, and we're here in Paris, the conversation in Europe is that maybe private markets can come to the rescue when it come, when the governments can't, when mm -hmm. the public markets can't as well. To what extent is that true? Well, listen, I think if you look at the deal flow that we've been seeing, it really sits in three main places, right? We're seeing more public to privates than ever before. We're seeing more corporate carve-outs, right? Taking non-core subsidiaries out of large corporates because they need to go focus on their core businesses. Yeah. And then these family partnerships that we're starting to see where you can partner with a founder a family-owned business, there are, there are probably three times more family-owned businesses in Europe than there are in the U.S., just to put it into context. Right. If you look at where we're putting capital to work, 80% of the deal flow that we've done in Europe, the deals that we've invested in Europe in the last 10 years, have come from these family partnerships, right? Yeah. That's creating a huge amount of opportunity where we can be a partner to those companies. The companies are focused on really one main thing. How do they grow, right? right? How do they increase their operational alpha? Because that's the competitive advantage the other, at the end of the day. And that's where the returns are coming from. Yeah. Eighty percent of our returns are coming from growing the bottom line of our companies and being thematic investors, not riding interest rates. Well, I, I think the point you make about family owned businesses is such a almost quintessential European one and mm -hmm. that so much of these massive growth opportunities, to your point, are still wrapped up in, in these family owned businesses. You see it in the luxury sector right here sure. in, in France as one example. Does that is that really just a question of float? Is that a market plumbing issue that you kind of leverage some of that ownership out? And and how receptive mm -hmm. are some of these families that you're targeting? I, I think these families really want best in class operations, right? Because what they've got to do to be competitive is to be able to grow, to consolidate their industries, to be that market leader. Yeah. And I think many of the families understand where where they can do it on their own and where they need to bring in a partner. Right. And I think that's less of around the market dynamics, but more around the operational efficiencies that have just happened when you think about um, production efficiencies, manufacturing efficiencies, all of that comes into place. Walk us through an example here. And, mm -hmm. and we talked about this before this interview, and I think it's a fascinating one and, and one that I personally did not connect the dots on. OHB, a German company, very mm -hmm. similar business model to what you're, you're outlining here, that you are now leveraging as, as, as a private kind of capital partner at a time when AI, space, satellite, data is sure. very much helpful. How do you value a deal like that mm -hmm. when in the public sector those valuations are seen as, as too high? Absolutely. So one of the examples that we had talked about is a German one where we partnered with a German family, a founder of a business is called OHB. Um, it were one of the leaders in space, um, more focused on the satellites, but the entire space um, ecosystem and value chain. This was a public to private. Yeah. Right. So this was one of those opportunities where you can go in and buy something that the market didn't understand. Sure. And what they're very focused on is growth. How do you make it more operationally efficient? How do you focus on consolidation across the industry? But also, how do you help them bring in best practices to grow their bottom line? So this is one of those opportunities where you can take the family partnership, but also the fact that they were publicly traded back to what we were saying before yeah. and not understanding that value dynamic in the market. But to your point about that value, does that make it cheaper then? Are these deals cheaper than in Europe because this is such a new phenomenon to a lot of these families? I, listen, I think you're always going to have to pay a fair price, right? This is not 1980s anymore where you can get things quote unquote on the cheap, right? You're going to pay a fair price, but what you pay at the end of the day with these families, they focus more on the who versus the what. Yeah. It's focused less around what value you're going to get out of this business, but how can we grow this together and are you the right partner for them? If you're the right partner, yeah. there's a value in that that's way beyond what you're 
you're paying for the company. So let, let's let's zoom this right back mm -hmm. out. In the last 24 hours, we had a report coming from Mario Draghi, echoing a lot of what we heard out of Europe, that mm -hmm. we need more money, we need more investment. What sweetens the deal? What attracts private capital when we're looking at an underperforming economy, an underdeveloped economy, and certainly not a deeper one as well? What's the, what's the sweetener? For, for firms like KKR? Sure. It really comes down to finding those good companies you can make great. So it's the quality of the business. This is less of a market timing value play, right? If you're trying to time the markets, you're not going to always get it right. So for us, it's more about the fundamentals, looking at the technicals, the fundamentals. How do you find those good companies where they want your partnership and you can actually double down focusing on best in class operational practices to drive your returns? That's the sweetener, yeah. right? It's that partnership and the operational value add. Well, I'm curious to see how that shows up in the likes of, of maybe partnerships with the likes of Emmanuel Macron or, or sure. Olaf Scholz. We'll have that conversation soon. Elisa Wood, a partner over at KKR, talking to us a little bit about how you actually find the attractive opportunities in Europe, a playbook that's very different from how they operate over in the States, Anna. Yeah, a, a really interesting conversation. The number of family-owned businesses in Europe has been a, a topic of conversation, a divide across the Atlantic for many decades. Kriti, thank you very much. Uh, Kriti, of course, continues her coverage from the EPEM conference, private equity in focus over there in Paris. Let's go from those private markets to the public markets. Joining us now to talk about what's happening this morning, uh, Markets Live executive editor Mark Cudmore. Mark, let's talk about these markets in a few minutes. And we're waiting for something. Guy and I were saying earlier, are we waiting for CPI on Wednesday? Are we waiting for the debate this evening, uh, just to get a sense of what the uh, the voting in swing states is that what we're going to be looking for a bit of clarity on post debate. I think it's the debate we're definitely waiting for, but it's a good point that we won't necessarily know the impact immediately. We obviously, unless there's a complete uh, clear victory like there was in the Trump-Biden debate, but I think without some kind of surprise or some shocking disappointment from one of the candidates, it might take a little bit of time to process. But it is absolutely the debate that is the focus this week. And it's very interesting, given that most of the last few years, CPI has been such an important print. And it shows how we have fully made the transition to jobs again being the focus rather than inflation. That was the case for most of the last uh, 20, 30 years until the last few years. And again, now we care about jobs over inflation, in particular because we've got through the COVID period of where we're getting really volatile inflation prints. And therefore, we know there's going to be less of a surprise either way in inflation. If it beats it or misses, it'll be only by a minor amount more in the rounding. How do I watch it? If I'm watching the debate... What is my indication? Is it Bitcoin? Is it futures, equity futures? Am I watching the two-year? What am I watching, Mark? So I, I used to say the betting markets were probably the best way to get the kind of the straightest interpolation. There's a lot more speculation now that betting markets are increasingly manipulated because people have realized that they're using the betting markets as a guide and therefore you get momentum through the betting markets. So I think they've been slightly undermined, whether validly or not. I think you've got to take a, a bit of the, the, the betting markets. I think you've got to take a bit of what's happening in crypto as a knee-jerk reaction as well. And then you've probably got to look at, at, at some of the, the basic asset markets. The problem there is, is there's a bit of a divide, and it goes with the political divide, on whether each candidate is good or bad for various asset classes out there. So I have to say that in the short term, until you get polls through, I do think, even though they're not perfect, it's betting markets and crypto that provide a better guide to the markets mm. reaction. Thinking of the macro stories of the moment, uh, Mark, we're dealing with quite a bit of news flow out of China, whether that's on the inflation front a couple of days ago or the, the export data uh, this morning, the trade data this morning. Chinese stocks have turned around from earlier losses and actually commodity prices a little firmer this morning. But that's not been the story of the last, well, uh, last days when it comes to commodities or the last years when it comes to Chinese stocks. Yeah, there's still a lot of pessimism there. It's, it's, you know, it's really not changing that kind of China negativity. Uh, the price action is very marginally reassuring on a very short-term basis, but that is in the context of several years of not being very reassuring. Look, I am still very constructive on global stocks into year end. I am just not seeing those growth concerns globally, but particularly in the US. Atlanta now GDP Fed has jumped over the past week. We're seeing good growth in the US. We're seeing OK growth globally. And I think that stocks will continue to trade positively on that story of solid economic growth, even if it's not at standing. Great stuff, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. Executive editor of the Markets Live team, Mark Cudmore. Six letters, MLIV Go. Punch those in. You get some fantastic analysis on what is happening in these markets. Let's talk about the single stock story this morning. Joe Easton has the details.
Morning, guys. We're watching AstraZeneca in London today after a negative update on one of their key lung cancer drugs that did not meet the significance of the trial that was expected to get, according to a statement from the company last night. And we saw the stock drop around 2.6% in U.S. trading. This is the ADR on the U.S. stock of AstraZeneca. Now, the drug is still likely to get approval, according to analysts, given it did show some strong survival results, but it's not as strong as expected. And if we we take a look at the joint venture partner of Astra on this drug over in Asia, Daichi Sankyo, getting absolutely slammed on this result, given that they've teamed up with Astra, down almost 9% overnight for that one. Definitely one to watch in London for Astra. We're also watching the software stocks. This after Oracle soared last night in the US. Strong bookings on the cloud business, driven by AI with some deals for the unit with competing that, excuse me, competes with companies like Microsoft and Amazon. But that stock up around 9% and we would expect to see a potential boost in the likes of SAP, Sage, Dissault Systems and Capgemini. All of those worth watching in terms of the read across there. Then we're also watching ASOS. This one is downgraded over at Barclays. They go underweight, citing the risk of competitive threats from Shein and also others. Keep an eye on that one after a massive rally. ASOS is underway at Barclays today. OK, thanks very much, Joe. Our equities reporter, Joe Easton, he'll be back shortly after the market opens to give us a sense of where stocks have been heading. The futures picture looks a little negative. FTSE futures down, six cents of one percent. Elsewhere, looking slightly uh, more positive. We will come back with the market open shortly. This is Bloomberg. Tuesday the 10th, let's take a look at the legacy going into this morning's opening trade. This is the picture. The white line is Europe. We kind of closed out in Europe, not actually too far away from where we finished in the United States as well. So the, the kind of the legacy out of that uh, afternoon trading session from a U.S. point of view, not that great for Europe this morning, which is maybe why we've got futures as becalmed as they are this morning. We're keeping a firm eye as to what is happening in China. We've got the debate coming up in the United States. We've got CPI data coming up shortly out of the United States. Uh, that's a story maybe for tomorrow. But at the moment, the FTSE 100 looks like it's giving back a little bit of ground this morning after yesterday's rally. We're down by circa six tenths of one percent. Elsewhere, we're absolutely flat on the Euro stocks 50. Nasdaq futures are a little softer. Apple didn't really do much yesterday. Got some key court rulings coming up for big tech, though, out of Europe this morning. So there's a few things to be thinking about, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. A few things to think about. In terms of individual stocks, just to recap some of the things we were hearing about from Joe Easton a moment ago, we'll keep an eye on AstraZeneca. We're going to be talking to the management of Astra in a couple of hours' time, in fact, here on Bloomberg TV, or just an hour and a half, in fact. And we've seen that the Daiichi share price, the Daiichi Sankyo, which is in partnership with Astra on a lung cancer drug, that stock is under pressure over in the Asia session, and so we'll be looking for what response we see in AstraZeneca. Uh, we are also focusing on the read across from Oracle's results and what that means for European names. Uh, profits came in above estimates. Growth in the cloud part of the business is crucial over at Oracle and we'll see what there is in it for Europe. And ASOS in focus, as Joe was telling us, downgraded at Barclays. A lot of focus on the competitive challenges that that business might face then, Guy. Anna, the rocket launch has been pushed back. The European equity market open has not. It is time for the European opening trade. Let's take a look. I think you're going to see a fairly quiet session today. We're waiting for the debate, but let's see some numbers. The market is open. This is the picture you find yourselves with on the screens in front of you this morning. FTSE 100 in and out of positive negative territory. The futures indicated a negative open by circa six tenths of one percent. So we'll see the downside maybe coming through uh, as the market gets fully open. Stock 600 absolutely flat as a pancake. Similar story for the Spanish market as well. Uh, so we'll wait and see really what the catalyst is going to be a little later on in the day. Mark Cudmore certainly indicating that he feels it could be that U.S. debate. How that translates into financial markets is going to be really interesting. But we do have the data as well to digest uh, over the next few hours out of the States as well. So that's the story, quiet-ish. The FTSE 100 not delivering the downside that maybe we anticipated. We're circa down two-tenths of 1% at, at the moment, Anna. What's below the surface? Yeah, well, technology and the gains in the technology sector seem to be beneath the surface. And this is interesting because we were talking about Oracle read across, and perhaps there is a little bit of that in here. We have Capgemini up by 4.8% within that technology sector, and that is one of the, the biggest contributors to that positivity. And then technology is uh, the best-performing sector this morning by some margin. 
in. It's up by four tenths of a percent. We have only two other sectors in positive territory. To your point, Guy, pretty quiet session uh, in terms of um, the, the futures expectations. They were pretty muted, weren't they, for European stocks? And most sectors are in negative territory. Autos and parts is the weakest performing sector. That is down by four tenths of one percent. It's uh, VW is in there. Some of the suppliers to the auto sector also looking a little weaker this morning. But that standout story to the upside around technology certainly seems uh, worth lingering on for a moment. Yeah, the likes of uh, Capgemini making gains, perhaps linked to what we heard out of Oracle. It's the biggest points gain in terms of the stock 600 this morning. Capgemini up by 4.1%, adding the most points to the upside. But ASML uh, is also adding points to the upside as well. After that, it's a more eclectic mix in terms of the stock story that we're watching on the upside. On the downside, what is clear is that we're seeing some weakness in the drug sector more broadly. You were talking about AstraZeneca, but in terms of the overall downside, we're seeing Nova Nordis down, Roche is down. You've also got Novartis under pressure as well. So you're certainly seeing some of that, uh, that trade coming off. But I think it's more than that. I think it's a safety trade that we're seeing some weakness in as well today. So you've got likes, the likes of Nestle under a little bit of pressure as well. Defensives have been outperforming cyclicals for a while now. Maybe a little bit of an unwind of that trade this mm. morning. Oil is also lower. Shell is down. Total is down as well. We're keeping an eye on that trade. Is any of this related to China? I'm not sure. Mm. That oil trade, I think, is, is going to be certainly one we're going to watch out for. People are calling more downside in oil. Yes, and it was a confusing hand across, read across, from the China story into, into London. It was always going to be a little murky because the overall bigger picture is one of negativity around Chinese stocks, it would seem, and we've covered weakness in commodity prices for, for many sessions, it would seem. But this morning, looking at the GMM screen, we actually have some strength coming through in some of the commodity markets, certainly through the Asia session, at least, yep. even if iron ore is now dropping now we're into London time. But a mixed read across then from China and that commodity story into Europe. But we are seeing worsening trade around autos, which is interesting. That sector now down by eight tenths of one percent. Let's broaden the conversation a little or at least dive into a different sector. Financial services, Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon has signalled a note of caution to investors. The bank's trading unit is on track to fall more than estimates uh, led by declines in its fixed income business, according to Solomon. Let's take a listen. First, with respect to trading, um, I would say that with Thicken Equities, we had an extremely strong uh, third quarter in 2023. Um, and given this quarter, given what I'd say is a more challenging uh, macro environment, particularly you know in the month of August, uh, that business is trending down close to 10 percent, largely due to Thick. Goldman Sachs, David Solomon, speaking uh, just yesterday, speaking on Monday, with uh, a little bit of guidance as to where the business goes. Let's broaden the conversation. Nancy Curtin, Global CIO at Wealth and Alternative uh, Manager, Alti Tiedemann Global, is with us this morning. Nancy, nice to speak nice to you. To see you as well. uh, maybe we'll take a dive into the financials shortly, and David Solomon, interesting there on what to expect from that kind of sector. But I want to start with the bigger picture with you, Nancy, because having read your notes this morning, I felt entirely more positive about the world. Good. <laughs> so, so maybe we can dive into some of that detail. You say any negativity here, it's just a pullback. The bull market is still intact. You don't seem nervous about anything like a hard landing in the US. You say this is what a soft landing looks like. Um, give us the top line on, 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 on the level of bullishness. Well, 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 first of all, look, the market's up already, you know, 16, 18 percent, depending on which day you use, because it's been so incredibly volatile. Uh, but I think the important thing is a soft landing was all about slowing the economy so we could get inflation down. Down. And that's what's been going on, right? We've come off the torrid pace of last year. Uh, jobs have come in a bit. Uh, there are pockets of weakness in the U.S. manufacturing, low-end consumers, et cetera. But generally, we think the U.S. economy remains resilient. And where there are pockets of weakness, help is on the way because the Fed is going to ease next week. And we think this is the beginning of further policy normalization to come. OK, so help is on the way in the shape of Federal Reserve yeah. interest rate cuts. But yeah. if things are as good as you say, or at least, you know, just normalizing or cooling a little but not collapsing, then we're not going to get a lot of help in a hurry from the Fed, are we, I guess? I think they're going to err on the side of caution here because, remember, as inflation has come down, real rates have gone up, so that would be passive tightening. In other words, the Fed would be tightening more if they didn't bring rates down. So we do think uh, there's more than 25 basis points, maybe 25 next week, maybe 75 or so before the end of the year. It will be data dependent, so we're going to have to watch the jobs and the inflation number as we continue. 
continue to do mm. uh, so far this year. But generally, we think uh, mid to upper end consumers in the United States doing just fine. Investment spend in that second revision of the second quarter GDP was up 7%. There's a lot of good things to talk about in the U.S. economy. And the pockets of weakness or in the more interest rate sensitive parts of the economy. And that's where the help is coming. And by the way, it's not just the Fed. ECB likely cut rates yeah. on Thursday, right? Bank of Canada cut last week. So this is an advanced economy, uh, global synchronized easing. And that, and that helps as well. If the Fed cuts 50, will that shake your confidence? No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, they want to get ahead of what they see as weakness in the labor market, or at least slowing. It's, it's yep. not really uh, collapsing, but it's definitely slowing, and they want to get ahead of that. So, no, I don't think so. If they do 50, then they'll do 25 next month. So, You talked about volatility. <coughs> if the volatility persists, should I take less risk? No, you've got to ride through this. Uh, you know, volatility tends to increase in the months before a presidential election cycle. Going back 10 presidential election cycle, uh, it always goes up in the couple of months before. And we have this kind of uncertainty uh, economically, et cetera. We're also experiencing a market rotation. That brings volatility as well because people are selling down tech uh, and positioning other parts of uh, the stock market. So, no, you've got to stay put. That's the point uh, of long-term investing. You've got to see through the volatility and not miss those days. Look at what happened in the month of August. If you had missed the turn, you would have missed a pretty decent August. So, no, you've got to ride through it. Mm. And you expect an inventory build ahead. Which sectors are we talking about? When, manufacturing. This sounds like something that could help Europe as yeah. well. Well, yeah. Well, Europe's a different. Mm. Uh, little kettle of fish, and I think Draghi's trying to do something there. But manufacturing, look, inventory to sales ratio is at a six-year low in the United States. We've had five months of manufacturing contraction. Uh, rates are coming down. Who wants to hold inventory in a high interest rate environment, right? But if growth continues, we think inventory build will be a positive contribution to GDP. Uh, and so we expect that to pick up uh, as, the, as the Fed brings mm. rates down. It makes the cost of financing uh, a bit easier for companies. Yeah. Absolutely. You mentioned Draghi. Let's have a moment to think about the European story because, yes, we're getting the benefit of uh, monetary policy easing from the ECB, but there are all these structural issues and <clears throat> competitive issues that We've been talking about for 20 years, it would seem, and back in 2003, there was a similar report talking about a lack of competitiveness in Europe and all the things that need to be done. <coughs> Your perspective, Nancy, does, does the fact that Draghi is saying it, such a serious character as Draghi is saying it, does that make any difference for what you expect to see with your international perspective here in Europe? <coughs> I hope so. Uh, Europe needs a Draghi solution, mm. uh, and he definitely has come out with yeah. a pretty strong clarion call here, and I'm very hopeful that van der Leyen listens. Mm. What about 50 basis points of cuts from the ECB? Would that help? Um, look, European growth is pretty moribund at the moment. Uh, but Does Europe I think need rate cuts more than the U.S.? I just think uh, the ECB will be cautious. I think we'll see 25 Why basis will it be cautious? Points. Because it's worried about inflation because still? Because it just is. Because it's just cautious. Uh, I think the better solution is what Draghi talks about. That's, which that's is, super long term. That is super long term, but that's what the markets need to see. They need to see Europe beginning to invest strategically to think about economic growth but, in the future. Yeah, and there, that is missing. Yeah, there that are just is lots missing. of examples of places that Europe agrees action needs to be taken, like uh, Banking <laughs> Union, for <laughs> well, example. And even with agreement that something needs to be done, you can't actually get to a deal. We need a crisis. You can't agree on the detail. Um, well, well we, yeah. probably need a, we probably need a crisis. But I think Draghi's report yeah. was a real clarion call, uh, you know, to the EU government that they need to do something. Otherwise, by the way, the United States will just continue to invest strategically. This is the new mantra for governments ahead. Strategic industrial policies, thinking about national competitiveness. Can I invest in that in the near term? I, that feels very no. kind of long term and no. very speculative. No, but take a do look I, at what the Inflation Reduction Act has done and the CHIPS why, Act why has done Why do I put States. money to work in Europe right now? What's the case? I drag painting a pretty bleak look, picture right now. I think there now. will be a recovery in Europe and, and Europe at the top down never looks terribly yeah. good. Bottom up, they have some very, very good companies, right? So if we get this advanced economy easing, many global companies will benefit mm. and stocks are cheaper in Europe. I'm not banging the table for Europe. We're overweight mm. okay. in the United States at the yeah. moment. So uh, I want to be clear about that. We still think the U.S. is the most interesting stock market, albeit more expensive. And we focus a little bit on Apple and its, uh, its offering in the AI arena. Uh, what does your thinking look like around AI and the extent to which you want exposure to technology? Because uh, 
because of AI in the technology space, or maybe AI starts to deliver in other sectors as well? How do you start to play that? Well, I think, first of all, AI is early innings, right? So I think the market is worried about these tech companies and all that spending. That will come, but it will come in time and will weigh on sentiment. But AI is an S-curve, right? So uh, right now we're going to move from all this digital infrastructure to AI at the edge. That's in our phone. That's Apple 16, probably 17 and beyond. But uh, I didn't see so many enhancements yesterday in the Apple, mm -hmm. uh, the Apple News Conference. It wasn't exactly Siri on steroids. But yeah, I think there is more to come there. But what really will happen is when AI takes hold in parts of the economy, sectors like industrials and financials yep. uh, and healthcare, that's when, and that is not priced in, and that's what we think is a really powerful long-term story. Great to see you, Nancy. Thanks for stopping by to see us. We really appreciate it. Nancy it's Curtin, Global CIO uh, at Wealth and Alternatives Manager, Alti Tiedemann Global. Thank you very much indeed. Morgan Stanley, by the way, sees the euro tanking 7% back to parity. ECB may be escalating uh, its rate-cutting cycle. Let's get back to the single stocks. Let's figure out what's happening in Europe this morning. This is what the Core 6 looks like right now, as you can see. A little bit of green on the screen. LVMH, Ferrari, both rising. ASML up by 8 tenths of 1%, doing some lifting this morning. But it's interesting, uh, you are seeing healthcare and some of the defensive stocks, which have been outperformers recently, struggling a little bit this morning. So Nestle, flat this morning. Let's talk about some of the other single stocks. The healthcare sector uh, is in focus. Uh, and hearing aids. Do I need to worry about the fact that maybe these new Apple Air AirPods can do that job for me, Joe Easton. Yeah, so that's exactly where we're going first, Guy. It is hearing aids, an unexpected area of the market today. These stocks getting hit following news that Apple is potentially going to be introducing a hearing aid function in the latest version of the AirPods. That's what they've said in their release last night as part of that big event. They do say that they haven't yet got FDA approval for this update to the product, but it does look like a threat to these stocks. So we are seeing likes of Amplifon, Demont, Sonova, GN Store, a lot of these listed over in Denmark and also Copenhagen and Stockholm, other cities around Scandinavia as well. So all of those getting hit on that news as well. Then staying in healthcare, we've got AstraZeneca. We mentioned this one in Stocks to Watch, and it is a pretty big move, down 5% for Astra on news that one of their key lung cancer drugs didn't quite live up to analyst expectations in the small cell lung cancer. We saw their joint venture partner actually falling around 9% in Asia as well overnight. So pretty negative news on that one. One of the worst performers on the FTSE 100 today, down 5% for Astra. Then we've got a couple of deals movers as well to bring you one of them here in the UK, a massive takeover for Sentiment. It's more than £2 billion. This is the gold miner. The gold prices at around $2,500 on the ounce has helped that company and it's up 23% today. A takeover from a South African company coming in for the UK firm. So that is a big mover today. And we've also brought up Rovi looking to sell some assets according to some Spanish press today. But that one not getting too much of a boost. It is actually declining 1.5% also in pharmaceutical. Then the software stocks now. We have got some moves in these. A bit of a read across from Oracle. So we're looking at SAP, Sage, Dassault. And also, very helpfully, one of our viewers has just messaged in and noted that Capgem does have a broker upgrade. I've just confirmed that with my sources. Bank of America upgrading that one, Capgemini. So that one up 5%. Also a read across from Oracle as well. Finally, we're going to do a couple of morning calls. ASOS, we mentioned earlier, and this one hit as Barclays goes underweight on this stock. Now, they've got a 290 price target. Look at the way the stock trade is now at 416. So a lot of downside. The competitive threat of Shein is what they're saying is the risk for that one. And finally, AB InBev, this one going the other way. Exane, BNP Paribas upgrades this following a rebound in Budweiser sales, according to Exane. That's the world's biggest brewer, and it's up 1.8% over in Belgium today. Joe, thank you very much. Joe Eason from our equities team. Uh, Joe was mentioning pressure on AstraZeneca and the share price there, lung cancer trial, uh, with uh, Daiichi not going so well or as, uh, as well as some had expected. Uh, we should say we're going to be speaking to Pascal Soria. Francine will bring you that interview in The Pulse. That's an exclusive conversation here at Bloomberg uh, coming up in the next hour of programming, just less than an hour from now. So good to get his perspective on that and a host of other things. Lots of news flow surrounding the business in China, of course, recently. And thinking of what's happening in China, um, we have Huawei debuting their trifold phone. We've had a cast of, of uh, management from Huawei speaking this uh, during this launch. 
Uh, and so this continues. We had the dancers earlier, now we have the speeches. They have unveiled this trifold phone. Now you can see it on your screens. We will continue to watch how that develops. Looks expensive if some of the pricing details we're seeing are correct. But anyway, maybe not everybody will be going for that one. Trying to work out why? How? Why do you need a trifold phone? It gives you something that's pocket size, but also bigger. But opens out into some sort of... I don't know. Mm. Anyway, we'll continue to pay attention to what is happening here. Clearly a response as well to what we're seeing from Apple. Um, talking about tech... We are going to be talking about what is happening on the legal side. Uh, the EU's top court said to deliver two key rulings today. Big tech rulings that we're watching out for, implications for Apple in the tax case. We're watching the Google antitrust decision as well. All of that on deck. We'll get some analysis on what we should be watching for and the implications from it. That's coming up on the show a little bit later. This is Bloomberg. mind for us to make sure that the market stays competitive while well, everything gets fueled uh, by artificial intelligence. It's, it's going to change the marketplace. It's really important that now when we have technology, which is not just a new technology, it's, it's basically a new world that we're looking into, uh, that we make sure that it's a competitive uh, new world. Margaret Vestaya, the EU's Competition Commissioner, outgoing Competition Commissioner, speaking back in April, talking about AI. Today, in some ways, her legacy is on trial. The EU's top court is set to deliver final rulings on two cases that could have major implications for big tech in Europe. Judges will decide if Apple owes a €30 billion Euro tax bill to Ireland, while Google will find out if it abused its market power by giving prominence to its own price comparison results in online shopping searches. Joining us now, Fiona Scott Morton, Professor of Economics at the Yale School of Management and Bruegel Senior Fellow. Fiona was previously Chief Economist at the Antitrust Division of the US Department of Justice, and last year she was named to the EU's Director, at, uh, Director General uh, for Competition before withdrawing from consideration. I think she's qualified to talk about this subject. Let's put it that way. Fiona, great to speak with you this morning. Thank you very much indeed for your time. How should we think about these two cases that are coming up? In some ways, so different, but in some ways, they are joined in, they in as much as they represent Europe's efforts to regulate big tech and the way that its economic effect is spread out throughout the economy. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. I, I think that the Google Shopping case is in a way the easier one to understand because it's just so old. This case was opened back in 2010 or thereabouts, so it's 14, 15 years old. And what that tells you is it's a bit irrelevant. I mean, it tells you that antitrust is so slow that what you need is something like the Digital Markets Act. And indeed, the EU decided antitrust was too slow, proposed the Digital Markets Act, adopted it, and it's enforced by now. And all of that before we get the final appeal. So that tells you um, that there's been a paradigm shift. The, the Irish case, the state aid case, is a little bit different because there you're thinking about analogizing, can a country pay a company to come build a factory there? Uh, is that the same thing as the country paying the company to put their headquarters there by lowering its taxes? So if this doesn't work for for Vestire, then what that just means is that the EU has to pass laws if it wants to, to control this kind of behavior. Mm. Uh, good morning to you, Fiona. So if we take the Google case uh, in, in the first instance, as you, as you set out there, going back to 2010, the fact that we have the Digital Markets Act now, Fiona, does that tell us that we won't see any of these big legal test cases uh, against big tech anymore? Will, it, will, will the, uh, the conflict, if that's not too strong a word, between Europe and big tech in the States, will that take a different form from here? It will take a different form. I don't think we're going to see no more of these cases, but the idea of regulation is that everyone knows what the rules are ex ante, and so they can moderate their behavior and the regulator can help them as things go along and you don't get as many of the antitrust court cases as you did before. In terms of how should we think about what is also happening in the United States at the same time? I'm starting to see the DOJ taking significant action, and I'm wondering whether or not 
it, it reinforces the European cases that we're watching go through and the European efforts that are being made. Is the United States behind Europe? Is Europe proving itself to be correct in the way that it has approached some of these cases by, by just watching what is happening stateside? I think that's a very good point. I think we are seeing the EU be proved right because the United States is bringing a lot of these cases a decade later and getting the same answer, which is a good clue that there was a good theory of harm to begin with. So we have the first of those results, the Google search uh, result in the United States, confirming that indeed Google monopolized and engaged in illegal behavior, even under a different uh, legal standard. But you can see the fundamental behavior being the same and being not competitive. That's interesting. So the U.S. following, and, and that's and that's your your view on the outcome. What about what Europe does from here, Fiona? Uh, post Draghi, now we've heard from Draghi and what he has to say about competitiveness, and he, uh, you know, one of many, but a very important voice to point out a lack of uh, tech and innovation in Europe. Was there anything new from Draghi that crosses into your universe that makes you think we'll see a different regulatory lens here in Europe? Um, well, he was very keen on enforcing the DMA. He says that in his report. He does have a lot to say about using European aid rather than at the national level, at the EU level, to try to achieve the goals of the EU if it's things like more technology, more innovation, more skills training. So I think it's it's a little bit subtle. It's not a dramatic, let's, uh, you know, blow up big tech or have more big tech, yeah. but, but a more a, a, a subtle message. But the, but the message was also Europe has too much red tape. And if, Absolutely. how should I think about that, given what has gone before? Is, are these court cases an example of too much red tape? Is, is Europe engaging in overreach? I heard what you said earlier about what is happening in the United States now. But is Europe, are the, is the red tape too tight in Europe? Imagine if you founded your business in Massachusetts and in order to sell in Connecticut, you had to go through the whole founding process again with re establishing yourself and what your product was and a whole bunch of regulatory effort. That would be a hassle. Every time you added a new state, you had to do that. That's what Europe is like. So, yes, there is too much red tape if you want to access the single market. It's a big problem. And, and what about what this means for uh, Commissioner Vestea, Fiona? I mean, as somebody who's watched everything that's happening on competition for a number of years, she's not going to be in this role for much longer. Yes, I mean, I think it would obviously be lovely for her personally if she won these things. I think the, the state aid taxes case is really a bit philosophical. I don't think it's about the exercise of normal competition law in Europe. It's asking the civil society, which way are we going to control this behavior? The Google Shopping case is important. If the court turns down Google Shopping, then it's just even more justification for having the Digital Markets Act, because you can't do these things through the courts. Thanks so much, Fiona. Good to speak to you. Fiona Scott Morton, Professor of Economics at Yale School of Management. We appreciate your time. Uh, coming up, insights from one of the largest French uh, firms in private markets. We hear from the executive president of Ardian live at the EPEM conference that's taking place in Paris. Lots to discuss there with Chrissy. This is Bingbeck. Thirty in London, 30 minutes into the equity market trading session. Quiet session. We're waiting, I think, for some catalysts to come through uh, from the United States in the form of CPI and, of course, tonight's debate. One thing that we were expecting this hour, but it's now going to be happening in a few hours' time, is the launch of the Polaris mission uh, from SpaceX. You can see that the rocket is still firmly anchored to planet Earth uh, and will be proceeding, we think, in circa, what is it, two hours from now. So basically what's happening in New York right now is that Manus Cranny and Danny Berg <laughs> are basically studying astrophysics and trying to gen up on exactly what this launch is going to deliver because it's now going to be in their hour yes. a little bit later You know all on. those times you say to yourself, it's okay, it's not rocket science, and yeah. then it is, it, it is. rocket science. Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we, we, uh, we, are, we are with them in spirit. Uh, it is an important, it's an important mission, though, isn't it, because of yeah. the, it being the, the furthest that humans have flown into space since the Apollo astronauts reached the moon, which certainly uh, gives it some... Uh, Gives it some impact. They're going to have a spacewalk as well. And there's the spacewalk. Which I'm quite excited about. Commercially funded spacewalk, so yeah. that'll be the first one. And the space suits look very cool. Um, in terms of some news we're just getting through, the EU is proposing that it's going to lower tariffs on Teslas and other EVs from China. The Tesla tariff will now drop to 8% 
from 9 percent. So it'll be interesting to see what the auto sector, maybe that's the reason why we're seeing some weakness that Anna was flagging a little bit earlier on. Um, let's take you from space to Paris. I'm not sure how you make that connection, but we're going to do it right now because Kriti Gupta, of course, is in Paris for EPEM. Kriti, take it away. Well, I'll make the connection here because I don't understand rocket science. Sometimes private equity, private capital markets feels like rocket science to me. Luckily, I have the perfect guest to talk about. I'm joined now by Mark Benedetti, the executive president over at Ardian. They oversee about $170 billion of assets under management. Let's just dive right into it. This is a French firm. This is perfect that we're here in Paris talking about it at a crucial time for French politics, but also for French investment as, as well. Mark, I want to start there. We'll, we'll dive into the broader stuff in a moment. Sure. You're visiting us from the States. You oversee a French firm. How are you thinking about the investment prospects of France right now? Look, you know, we were obviously, our firm was born here in Paris. Uh, we've been local here for a long time. We very much believe in the European story. And if you look at our roots, you know, France, Germany, Italy have been areas we've been investing from the start of Ardian, so 25 years ago. It's done very well over the last 25 years. It will continue to do well over the next 25 years. But you really have to be multi-local. So we have local people in the offices that have been there for years and years, and that helps us develop those relationships with entrepreneurs. What is the European story? Look, I think that if you look at the kind of companies that we invest in, we are specialists at taking sometimes French champions and making them European champions, or European champions and making them worldwide champions. You know, we just invested in a company called Magimix, which you probably saw here in France which is a worldwide renowned brand, and yeah. we're helping them grow to the next level. When we talk, though, about private markets, kind of filling the gap to, in, in some ways where fiscal budgets are, are constrained, where you have like some Mario Draghi, for example, calling for just shy of 1 billion euros in investment, how believable is that? Is there really that enthusiasm for private capital or from private players, I should say, when it feels like there's a lot of hesitation from everyone else? I think that is a big tailwind, actually, for certain parts of private capital, notably our infrastructure business. So we are the biggest European infrastructure investor, and we've been investing in Europe for years and years. And, you know, they need that capital investment to help the infrastructure grow, to flourish, to blossom. Yeah. They can't do it alone. They need to do it in partnership with private capital. But you have to pick the right spots because these are very highly regulated assets. So you want to be in an area, in a country, in a city where you know the regulation is airtight and you have those relationships as well. Well, you, you led me right to where I wanted to go, which is that's also a big inhibitor for, for Europe broadly, uh, to the point that it has dissuaded a lot of your, your colleagues in the space for, for years. And I'm curious, what needs to lighten there? Look, I think that if you think about what needs to lighten, first of all, you have to be local. I think it's very hard to invest throughout Europe if you're doing it from a distance yeah. or if you're doing it from one office trying to cover all the different geographies because yeah. they're extremely different. The different drivers in Italy versus France versus Germany are all completely different. So I think first of all you have to be local and you have to spend the time to get to know the assets, get to know the market, get to know the regulators yeah. and then you start to understand what's at risk and what's at play. Well it's handy that you're coming here from the States because I'm curious about deal flow, as we all are, and when these kind of capital markets are going to open up. There's $3 trillion wrapped up in private capital markets right now. To the disdain of hedge funds, endowments, a lot of players who are saying, when are we going to get our returns? Do you have Absolutely. a timeline on that? Yeah, so it's a great question. I think if you look back on the last three years and we look at the capital calls versus distributions, we're still calling more money than we're sending back to the investors, okay, globally for the private equity buyout industry. Yeah. It was 170% in 2021. It is 110% now. So it's getting better. So the yeah. log jam is loosening up a little bit. But to your point, there's still a lot of assets trapped there. What gives me a little bit of hope is a few things. First, the assets are performing well. So in our portfolio, we had double-digit EBITDA growth over the last 12 months. And we see that across a lot of established buyout assets. So that's a big plus. Secondly, the dry powder that was raised to invest in these assets is getting older. Yeah. These funds have raised money and they have to put it to work. 25% of the dry powder in private markets in buyout is more than four years old. You know, typically there's a five-year investment period. Yeah. So groups have to start putting money to work. So that bid-ask spread should start to narrow. And I think it's going to be a very active Q4 and Q1. So Apollo Scott Kleiman called this dynamic the pig moving through the python. 
a gruesome image, but I think an accurate <laughs> one. And it feels like so much of that hinges on just when the IPO market is going to see even more activity. And I'm curious if the interest rate picture spurs that kind of uh, excitement, perhaps, in, in the public markets. Yeah, I think that that's part of it. I think the interest rate you know, discussions, we'll see where it goes. You know, people are calling for different rate cuts over the next uh, 12 months. If it's 25 basis points down, then 100 basis points later, we'll see. I do think that people want a sustained couple of months of at least lower volatility in the public markets before they IPO their assets. Yeah. But we're still seeing the IPO market is somewhat frozen for the EV 5 to 10 billion companies. For the larger companies, you can see a few have reopened and then they're yeah. doing well, but it's still a little bit tight there in the middle. What is the benefit of being public in this environment, given the valuations, given some of the jitters that you're talking about? What's the point? Well, I think that's a great point. So we get the question a lot saying, what does, you know, will private markets one day overtake public markets? Yeah. I don't think that's the case. You know, you need a very big active public market out there, really for the largest companies. So if you look at the mega cap companies, there's no private equity solution for these multi, multi, multi billion dollar, even approaching trillion dollar EVS. So if you think about that, you always need the public markets to fill that role. And I think that's going to have to continue. But I don't think that, that that middle market is where private equity has been playing a role that's been more important than years past. So you say that private markets may not be able to take the, overtake the public ones. Could it in Europe, though? No, but I do think across different people's allocations, they're starting to say, hey, you know what? Private equity has done very well for me. It's outperformed over five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, yeah. at least 500 basis points or more. So, and if you look at the volatility in private markets compared to the public markets, it's much less. It's almost a third of the volatility in the private markets that we see compared to public markets. Yeah. So we have groups across Europe saying, hey, you know what? Maybe I should be more than 10 or 15% to private markets. I should be larger than that. Yeah. And that's why we see the whole industry going from about 13 trillion of AUM today, upwards of 20 to 25 trillion by 2030. So it's massive growth. It, it is massive growth. And there's a lot of optimism in these private markets. But in the public markets, you say when there's so much optimism, that's when you know you're in a bubble or that's when you know a crash is coming. Walk us through this idea of when the party stops for, for private capital markets, and I specify that specifically because it feels like so much of the outperformance post-COVID and in the last couple of years has been driven by this search for yield. But if you're getting that yield in the bond market or in emerging market currencies or even in the stock market, arguably, with this AI boom, why go to private? It's a great question. I think, look, there's definitely a pickup in yield right now in fixed income that you're getting that is quite attractive. Yeah. I do think that you get a very strong return in private markets and with a longer duration, which is what a lot of these long-term investors are looking for. But to your point, I think the easy money that was made in private markets and in the rest of the financial markets from just the low interest rate environment, that's gone. And yeah. that's not coming back for three years or five years or ten years. So it's really back to basics. It's investing in companies that have good growth stories, helping them grow, operational strength, great yeah. management teams. And that's, it's going to be, you know, private equity 101, which is going to rule the day for the next ten years. One of the hindrances of that argument, though, is, and you hit this earlier, the regulatory scrutiny. And specifically, I want, I want to zero in on a conversation in the U.K. at the moment when it comes to taxation around carried interest. What are your conversations looking like on this? How much of that is a, is a headwind for investment in the U.K. Sure. and arguably the rest of Europe? Yeah, look, I would say that, at least for us, for Ardian, we're in 19 offices around the world. You know, taxation ebbs and flows. Whether it's the U.S., you know, we saw it in France years ago when Hollande was elected. There was a lot of questions there about what was going to happen. And if you're making your decision based on taxation for a given geography, you're not taking a long-term view. So, yes, it will ebb and flow. You, know, you might have some more people or less people in private markets in those geographies, but you've got to take a view of five years to ten years plus for these assets. And if you're making a decision based on taxation, you're probably making the wrong one. The budget in the U.K. comes up, I believe, at the end of October. What do you need to hear from Keir Starmer, and arguably Emmanuel Macron or, or Mario Draghi, or, or you know, pick your, 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 your European politician? What do you need to hear to say, this feels like a better regulatory environment for me? I think that's a great point. I think for us, what we look for is stability. Okay, whether, you know... Some would argue the UK is the island of stability right now. Right, and I, I would say that once people have a sense that they know the rules of engagement that are impacting the regulation across private markets, public markets, good or bad, once you know the playbook, then you can actually implement what you want to do. 
Until that time, you're going to say, you know what, let's wait. If I was about to buy this asset or do an add-on acquisition in the U.K. or I want to expand in the U.K., if things are too much in flux, you're going to wait. And, you know, this uncertainty, that's the killer for private investment. So I think that you need some stability. You need some clarity on exactly what the rules are. And then people start to roll out their plans for investment. All right. Mark Benedetti, we'll leave the conversation there. We thank you so much. He's the executive president over at Artie. And joining us from the States, of course, overseeing about $170 billion in assets under management. This is an important conversation in terms of attracting that capital to Europe. They want the investment, but the regulation may just be getting in the way. Chrissy, thank you very much. Chrissy Gupta, of course, from the EPEM conference in Paris. Really interesting views there on the UK, on stability, also the role of public and private markets for large and small businesses. Interesting conversation. And we thank Chrissy for bringing that to us. 8.42 here in London. We don't have the SpaceX uh, liftoff taking place right now, as we had anticipated that it would. It's been pushed back, so that will be coming later. In the meantime, we have even more time to talk about some of the interesting developments uh, in other fields over the past 24 hours. Uh, coming up, former ECB President Mario Draghi is calling for as much as 800 billion euros of new spending by the European Union. Uh, where's that going to come from? We will talk about his report on competitiveness next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the opening trade. We have news breaking from, uh, well, in, in connection with Apple and its legal fight. We were talking about this with a guest earlier who was getting us prepared for this news. Apple loses an EU top court fight over a 13 billion euro Irish tax bill. The EU's top court has said that Apple was given illegal state aid. This ruling then seen as a, a boost to the EU's crackdown on tax deals for big firms. And this goes back to uh, the plans that were, or the offer that was made to Apple by Ireland around its tax rates if it were to position certain operations within Ireland. Uh, so we have some conclusions there. Let's bring in uh, to the conversation Oliver Crook, who's in Berlin for us, of course, tracking all of these uh, EU stories for us. And uh, this one is uh, front and centre today, just getting some news lines about it. Oliver, we were talking to a guest earlier who was preparing us, saying that this was going to take to, to, to attest as to whether state aid rules were going to be enough here or whether Europe was going to require other legislation. What do you make of this news? Yeah, so listen, I mean, this is something that has been rumbling on since 2016. There was a, it was when the uh, fines were originally levied by the uh, European Commission. And again, this is absolutely huge. This is, 50, this is 13 billion euros uh, worth of fines and has to do with that tax bill over in Ireland. This was then knocked down by the European General Court back in 2020, and this was supposed to be the final ruling. So this obviously will have massive implications, obviously, for Apple, um, which is now facing a you know very, very large uh, tax bill um, in Ireland. This has obviously will have some implications for Apple. Um, Ireland as well, which has managed to bring so many of these companies into um, its jurisdiction because of these low sort of rates. I mean, it also has, you know, obviously big uh, ramifications for the EU as the sort of regulator um, for all of these companies across Europe. And obviously also as the legacy, and we shouldn't forget, of Margaret Vestager, who has been two, year, uh, two terms now in the European Commission, uh, the commissioner for competition, one of the most powerful rules um, here in Europe. She is almost done with her term in the next couple of weeks. So this is really kind of like one of the last hurrahs and really a significant one in her sort of quest to be the kind of the big regulator for um, you know technology across the world. What I also think is interesting is we also get this around the time of the Draghi report, right? And the old adage is America innovates, Europe regulates, and that is certainly what we are seeing here um, on that side. We're also waiting for that ruling on Google, which is more of a sort of antitrust um, about favoring its own shopping services online. That's also been going on for 14 years. So there's a lot yep. happening out of Brussels today. Oli, the other piece of news that we've had out so within the last few minutes is that we are going to see the tariffs that are being applied to Tesla, effectively Tesla exporting out of China into Europe, being reduced. Why? Yeah, so listen, this is an ongoing uh, investigation. They're getting more and more data um, as the investigation by the EU Commission goes on. It's been going on for, you know, almost a year now. Um, and they sort of put these proposals forward. They went to these firms in China who produce there and try to uh, assess how much subsidy and sort of incentives they get from the Chinese government. And depending on that, they're adjusting the rates. So initially, Tesla was looking at something like 20 billion, uh, sorry, 20 percent. I'm seeing just now that the Google news is crossing now that Google is also losing the <laughs> EU court fight and is uh, for 
4 billion euro fine. Again, we were talking about this earlier. This is the antitrust case um, that the EU is taking against Google. So these are two really major wins for uh, Margarita Vestager um, here that are the final rulings at the European Court of Justice, all of which have been appealed, many of them for you know almost more than a decade. We're talking about more than 15 billion euros worth of payments that now will be required from Apple and Google that just crossed here over the last couple of minutes. Yes, and just to reiterate then, getting that red headline across the Bloomberg terminal then, Oli, on Google. Google loses the EU, EU fight to overturn $2.4 billion worth of fines. So it is a, a smaller fine there, but EU judges saying that Google abused dominance in a, a, this shopping case. So that's two pieces of news going Europe's way. But we yeah. heard from Draghi yesterday, he doesn't want Europe to be, I mean, he wasn't passing judgment on, on, uh, on, on legal stories, but he, he doesn't want the European tech story to be all about legal challenge. Uh, he, he wants there to be more innovation in Europe and he wants there to be a more competitive Europe. I suppose these stories are linked in that sense. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I doubt he has in mind many of the sort of massive behemoths that exist um, over in the United States, you know. I mean, I think that also what's interesting is that, particularly on this Google case, this is before the Digital Markets Act, which was passed um, very recently, which is supposed to deal with this sort of behavior. So it's interesting now that this is something that predates that and still um, these fines are going through. Yeah, but the situation and the, and the conversation that Mario Draghi is trying to put forward is basically dealing with the fact that Europe has no company like Apple, like Google, like NVIDIA basically zero. He says that in the last 50 years, um, there has not been a single company that has been founded in Europe that has a market cap that exceeds 100 billion euros, whereas in the United States, you have six that exceed now a trillion dollars. What he is saying is that basically Europe has failed in terms of creating companies to capitalize on the internet and the digital age, and that has led to massive uh, productivity shortages and a huge gap between what you see in Europe, what you see in the United States. And what Draghi is saying is that this basically could amount to the loss of Europe European competitiveness. It already doesn't exist. But if it does not, if it goes untreated, this will mean that basically Europe will become economically irrelevant in the decades to come. And that sounds sort of stark. And he's a very sort of mild mannered guy, as we know. And we don't really want alarmists at the head of the ECB, which is perhaps why his messaging comes out so tenderly. But he's talking about existential threats to the European economy if they cannot get this together. I mean, he talks about in the United States, um, the sort of average wages, um, uh, the, the disposable incomes have, have grown more than twice what they have in Europe over the last 25 years. And these are the things that basically, as Europe, as it is right now, cannot address and will not address. And is a massive problem that really threatens the future of Europe as A, a political entity, but B, obviously as an economy. Absolutely. I feel like we've heard some of this before, but the solutions remain the same. And I think Europe's going to struggle to deliver those, deliver those solutions. Ollie, thank you very much indeed for the update. Uh, two key court rulings within the last few minutes. Uh, we will continue to obviously monitor the fallout from both of them as we work our way throughout the morning and head towards the US Open. Um, one thing that we will also be watching as we head towards the US Open is the second window for the SpaceX launch. We were anticipating it this hour. It now looks as if it's going to happen in a couple of hours' time. Manus Cranny and Daddy Berger will be walking you through that. But let's talk about what we've seen this morning and the significance of this launch. It is becoming quite common to see SpaceX launches, but this one feels a little bit different. Kate Duffy joins us now, UK Airlines and Space reporter. Nice to see you this morning. Good to see you. Do we know why it was deferred, delayed? Yes, so SpaceX has said it's literally just because of unfavourable weather conditions. Right. So they can't launch because of the bad weather. So Mother Nature, unfortunately, isn't on their side this hour. But they have got two other windows today, uh, one being in the next two hours and then two hours after that. And then if that doesn't go ahead, then hopefully then tomorrow. Mm. Um, but this mission, we, we thought it would go ahead maybe two weeks ago, yep. a couple of weeks ago, but then because of a helium leak, that got postponed. Um, and then it's just been because of bad weather conditions. And as you said, this is just so common in the space industry. This isn't a SpaceX issue. This is what a lot of rocket companies face when they try and launch rockets. Yeah. Um, they want it to be safe. They Obviously, they've yep. got four people on board. There's even more safety precautions going in there, um, a lot on their shoulders. So, yeah, they're just waiting for the right weather and hopefully they will okay. launch, yeah. So we could see it launch later this morning, European time. Um, talk us through the significance of this, because it's significant uh, because what they're going to be doing once they get to space and also how far they'll be going. 
going? Yeah, so it's the first commercial spacewalk that we're going to see. Um, so no other private company has done this in space so far. Um, so SpaceX will be the first. And um, it'll also be the furthest that, that people have gone into space since the Apollo mission reached the moon. Um, and it'll also be the furthest that women have ever travelled from Earth. So there's a lot hanging on this launch. Um, and it'll be so exciting to see how it goes. And as you said, um, there is the spacewalk uh, as well, which sometimes seems a little bit uneventful. Um, yeah. Walk is a straight <laughs> Walk is a strange word to attach it to, is, really, isn't yeah. it? It's a sort of, yeah, space dangle. Yeah, kind of, <laughs> yeah. And we're not really sure, entirely sure, what the kind of the purpose is of this particular spacewalk. Um, but what it will do is sort of add to SpaceX's portfolio. And um, it will, you know, they, they have a lot of... Uh, a lot of things going on in their business right now with Starlink, and that's something else that they'll be testing in, in uh, the mission too, Starlink in space. Um, and they'll also be conducting lots of scientific experiments too with, with the uh, human body and mm. reaction on Earth yeah. and in space. So, yeah, it'll be really exciting once it goes ahead. This is, this is a precursor, though, to other things. I, the, the reason maybe they are testing this is because of the, the suits. They, they talk about needing lots of them in the future because they're going to be doing lots of this kind of thing, starting on the moon and ultimately going further than that. Yeah, so the whole aim is to sort of create this base on moon and Mars, and it yeah. seems like a very future, distant issue. But it is something that SpaceX wants to start creating right now. And yeah. as you say, like, scale up these, these white, sleek uh, space suits. Cool. They are very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's lots of images on them on social Media if I'm at the going moment. to Mars, I, I, I'd like to look cool and probably <laughs> yeah. be cool because it might be a bit warm. <laughs> exactly, yeah. They do actually have like thermal materials in them as well. Um, so they've worked on these for a while and they've got these heads up displays inside. Um, so they look very cool, something from the movies. Yeah, I, I think they look <laughs> awesome. You, I can't wait if you need to stay cool or stay warm, one, one or the other. But they're going to open this thing up and everybody's going to have to wear one because they're going to decompress the whole of the capsule, which is yep. amazing. Yep, absolutely. Kate, thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for bringing us the analysis. Uh, Bloomberg UK airline and space reporter Kate Duffy with her eyes firmly fixed on uh, Florida's Kate Canaveral. We'll be watching that. We'll also be watching what's taking place elsewhere in the United States in terms of the debate, a debate between uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, yep. and, uh, and uh, former President Trump. The, the first, first between one, these two. The, the, it's kind of the first but second. Yeah. The first one was hugely consequential as much as it effectively pushed Biden out of the race. But this is the one that ultimately could have a huge impact on who ultimately occupies the White House next. We're also going to be hearing from Pascal Sorio as well. Absolutely. That stock's down really hard this morning. Yeah, AstraZeneca facing headwinds in China. We talked about that last week. And also this morning, the news is around uh, a drug trial for lung cancer. So we'll certainly uh, be getting to that. Francine Lacroix conducting that interview with Pascal Sorio. That's coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg.